still in uh, the book of 1 John. And uh, this morning we're going to talk about the last full measure of devotion. Now, I don't want to pry into your personal and private lives, but here's my question. How many of you today have a debt? Oh, you're all debt free. I am so happy for that. That's the first time I've seen this many people totally debt free. How many of you have a debt? Okay. Thank you for being honest. I don't want to know how much it is. I can tell you only that it, it bothers me greatly that uh, the majority of pastors are in huge debt. And uh, I want to thank you for supporting your pastor because we're not in huge debt. We pay for our mortgage, but that's the only debt we have, I believe. Except the light bill, which is constantly going up. We all have debts. How many of you have ever been in a position uh, where things have been so tight you didn't know if you'd be able to pay your debt? Yep. How comfortable is that? Not comfortable. How many of you have lost sleep over that? Yep. Okay, well, we're all in the same club, aren't we? Yeah, we all have that issue. Uh, Caesar Augustus, the first Roman Empire, had a sharp wit. And um, after hearing about a Roman nobleman who had passed away with enormous debts, which were kept private throughout his lifetime, he sent one of his emissaries to the auction to bid on a single item. Any guesses to what the item was? He sent his emissary to bid on the man's pillow. His reason that pillow must be particularly conducive to sleep if its late owner, in spite of all his debts, could sleep on it. I'd say that was witty, wouldn't you? Yeah, I know that many of us have awakened in the middle of the night going, how in the world am I going to do the deal with this? How am I going to pay this debt? How am I going to pay this bill? The interesting thing is that everybody, even though they may be totally financially stable and not have one financial obligation in their lives, still has a debt, what would that debt be? Your sin debt. Your sin debt. We all have a sin debt. And that's why Jesus is so awesome. You know the song that says, He paid a debt he did not owe. I owe a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace, Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. You know what? Sometimes... Sometimes, when we come together in worship, it burdens my heart because I understand the debt that all of us owed and have had to pay. And though we could not pay it, Jesus paid it for us. And yet, sometimes, it just seems worship is joyless. It burdens my heart. If anyone, if anyone had their obligations wiped out like our debt has been wiped out, this place out of rock with joy. Don't you think? When I was a, a young married guy, first married, my wife was pregnant with our first child. 
We didn't have two pennies to rub together. Anybody been there but us? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. How in the world are we going to pay for three when we can hardly take care of two? And a friend of mine had lent us some money because we were short at the end of the month. And then he came to us one day and he said, forget it. It's a gift. Can you imagine how that felt? It was like, what? No, you're kidding. No, keep it. It's all right. Now, if you've never been in that circumstance, praise God. But if you have been in that circumstance and somebody was that generous to you, it creates a joy in you and the burden is just lifted. Now, I don't want you to go into debt so you can find out what that's like. But I will tell you, I remember to this day that man's name. His name was Phil Matthews. I remember what he did for a living, and I know how hard he worked, and I know what paying that debt cost him. You see, the paying of a debt always costs someone. If you pay your debt, it costs you in labor or self-denial. If someone else pays that debt, it costs them either out of their own pocket or it costs them a portion of their life. But when the debt is paid, it costs somebody. Amen? Because the debt has to be paid. When we talk about Jesus and the line from the Gettysburg Address comes to mind, they gave the last full measure of devotion. Jesus loves us so much, he gave the last full measure of devotion. What did he give? He gave his life. He gave himself. He held nothing back for you and me. As we look at the scripture today, we have to understand that when we accepted his vicarious sacrifice on the cross, that we in turn received a moral debt of obligation. He bought us. Never forget Dr. Fermin Whitaker from the California State Convention used to say, he bought my contract, he can do with me whatever he wants to do. When you received Christ as Lord and Savior, he bought your contract, he paid your debt, he bought you out of your sin slavery. And because of that, you have a moral obligation to your Redeemer. Does that make sense? But you know, it's ironic he doesn't come and put your arm up behind your back and say to you, you owe me. Have any of you ever felt that? Oh, you owe me. I guess I better do this. If you're here today, I hope you're not here because you feel God's got your arm behind your back but you're here out of love and gratitude to your Savior. You came to honor Him. 1 John 3.16 We know love by this. I like that word know. We know. Word is gnosko. It means we know, we understand. We know His love by this. We understand by this that He laid down His life for us and, the corollary, we ought to lay down our lives for him. Wow. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren, for each other. We don't lay our lives down for Christ. We lay down for the brethren. Or some people say the cistern, too. 
we give our lives for each other. No place in the body of Christ for selfishness. No place in the body of Christ for holding back. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children. You ever realize the implications of that term, little children? What do you know about little children? Little children are by nature what? They're loud. Well, he can't call us little children. There are a few loud people here. They're messy. They're dependent. They're beautiful. You ever see a little baby wrapped up? You know, they're beautiful. There's nothing like a little baby. But you ever look at their hands? You ever notice their hands? How are their hands? They're like this. Gimme, 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 gimme. You watch those uh, seagulls in Finding Nemo. How many of you have seen that movie? Mine, 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 mine. Do you have to teach a kid that? They're by nature selfish. Look, he calls us little children. What's the application? Mine, 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 mine. You are what? Selfish. That's why he's talking to you. Love is not selfish. Love is about everybody else. Love is sacrificial. How does the love of God abide in him? If he closes his heart to someone else. Little children, let us not love with word or tongue, but in deed and truth. We will know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our hearts before him in whatever our heart condemns us. For God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. This is his commandment that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and what? Love one another just as he commanded us. Now we're going to go light speed here, because in this little passage there are seven principles I want you to notice. Seven compulsory principles. What do I mean by compulsory? You cannot ignore them. They are part and parcel of being a believer in Jesus Christ. Loving Jesus compels us to do these. First principle, moral obligation. Verse 16, we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. We ought to. We ought to. What does that say to you? That we should, but often don't. We should, but often don't. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. That's an unselfish act. That demands the last full measure of devotion from you and me. As Christ has loved us, we are to love one another unconditionally. That means we extend forgiveness. We cannot withhold from one another forgiveness. We cannot, we cannot offer bitterness for a perceived slight. We cannot behave as a lost world behaves. Because why? Because we love one another. 
Now, does that mean that we love everybody who's like us, or that we just love everybody? We love everybody. Now, we are human beings. Is that not true? I mean, look to your left and right. Are you going to see another human, or are you going to see an alien? No, you're going to see a human being. And if you see another human being, we have these things in common. We have the human shortcomings. We have bitterness. We have anger. Yesterday coming home, Jane and I were uh, down in Roseville. We were coming home, and this lady from the uh, first lane up against the, uh, the, the barrier wall shot across, missed us by inches. No signal, no looking, right in front of us. Another split second, we would have been in a terrific accident. I was not feeling forgiving. <laughs> Human emotion. I was angry. She could have injured us. She could have injured my wife. You think God would forgive that? Yeah. He died to forgive sinners. So what could I do? I had to forgive her. I had to let it go. Couldn't be living in that the rest of the day. There are times in the body of Christ when we offend one another. Isn't that true? Yes, it is. So what does the offended one do? He forgives. She forgives. And I'll tell you this, friend, the one who refuses to forgive is no better than an unbeliever. Ouch. That's painful. But it's true. Because you have an obligation of love that Christ gave you. When Jesus bought us out of the sin debt, he agreed to become, we agreed to become his and to do as he pleased, not as we pleased. 1 Corinthians 7, For he who was called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's redeemed man. Likewise, he who was called while free is Christ's slave. You and I are slaves to Jesus Christ. We're slaves. But we are willing slaves. Do you realize in that time in history, a man could be set free from his slavery either because he had paid his debt or that the, the slaveholder loved him and chose to let him go? And if he decided to stay, then the slaveholder would take an awl and pierce his ear, indicating that he owned him. Now, yeah. But it was a mutual agreement. When you received the love of Christ and you were forgiven, you became a willing servant of Jesus Christ. That means you gave up your will to his will. Ephesians 5, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. We have an obligation to one, love one another unconditionally. That means extending grace, mercy, patience, kindness, goodness, all those fruits of the Spirit. We extend those. So, do I just love those who are believers? No. Jesus answered that question. Luke 10, 27, he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Now, what does that neighbor mean? It means not only the brethren, but the ones who live in proximity to you. Your neighbors. People around you. You know, quite frankly, there are people in our neighborhood who probably aren't that lovable. Do you have any people like that in your neighborhood? 
Now, the ones who live next door to Art don't answer that. If I didn't tease Art, he'd think I was mad at him or forgot him. Because we love God with all our hearts, we are obligated to love our neighbors with all our hearts. Second principle, generosity, verse 17. Whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? When you understand that all you possess is not yours, you are simply a steward. You've heard this a thousand times, I'm sure. If you live in a nice house, it's not yours, it belongs to God. He gives you the ability to pay for it. He gives you the strength to earn what you have. If you have a full refrigerator or a full pantry, it's not yours, it belongs to God. It is His. He gives you stewardship, He gives it to you for your good. But He also gives everything you have to be used for the good of others. To be used for His purposes. You give up selfishness. The word generosity comes from generosus, which means of noble birth. Do you know that? I love to look up words and find out where they get their, their beginning. Generosus came from a word that means of noble birth. There's a story told about Alexander the Great who is going along the road, and he sees a beggar on the road who asks for alms. And he reaches into his purse and he hands the man a gold coin. And the military officer next to him says, Sir, sir, a copper penny would have been sufficient for him. Alexander says, Yes, but not for Alexander. You see, when God looks at us, we're beggars in his kingdom, and he blesses us with riches. But the blessing is meant to be extended to those who need it. That's giving the last full measure. That's giving to others out of love. The third principle is the principle of action. Look at verse 18. Little children, let us love not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and in truth. What you say doesn't mean a hill of beans if your actions do not match your words. John's simply telling us that our walk is as important as our talk. We have an obligation to walk the talk. What do you say about a husband who says he loves his wife, but he totally ignores them? Or a wife that doesn't minister to the needs of her family, and yet says, I love you? We see the effects of it in our world today. I love you, I care about you, but I don't spend any time with you. I don't give you the most precious gift I have, which is time, commitment. You spend a dollar, you can earn another dollar. You spend a hundred dollars, you can probably earn another hundred dollars. But once you've invested time in someone else, that time is gone. You can't go back and get more time. It's history. More precious than anything you own is the time God's given you. And generosity is the investment of time in those who need your time. They need your the affirmation of their humanity, and they need to know about the love of God. One fellow was talking to his next door neighbor about a speaker he heard the night before, and he told the neighbor, that guy said something that really stuck in my mind. He said that all the world's problems could be summed up in two words, ignorance and apathy. What do you think? And the neighbor replied, and he says, I don't know and I don't care. You know, I, I, I'm sorry to say that sometimes that's church. What do we know, truly know, about our lost neighbors? We're good at loving one another, but loving people outside of our society, out of our church group, that's another story. 
because we're good at loving the brothers, but not so good at loving our neighbors. Because it's an infringement on our time. It means a sacrifice of time. That's a little harder to deal with. And there's nothing quite as dangerous to a church as church apathy. We need to look and see people with the eyes of Christ. Matthew 9, seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. You look around us right now. I'll tell you how, how scared people are. How many of you have been going down the road in your car and you look at the car next to you and there's one person in the car, one person, wearing a mask? What is that? It's fear. It's fear. It's fear. The world is full of fear and you have the solution for fear. The fourth principle is truth. Verse 19, we will know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our heart before him. What does it say? We will know by what? Take a look. We will know by what? We will know by our actions that we are of the truth. Little words mean a lot. Who can say what I just read? We are what? What did it say? Didn't say we're truth. Didn't say we're in truth. It says we're what? Of the truth. What does that word of mean? It means that we are derived from the truth. What are we derived from? Who are we derived from? We are derived from Christ. What does he say? You shall know the truth. Truth is a person, folks. Jesus is the person of truth. And when we behave as Jesus would want us to behave, we behave as though we are of Christ, of the truth. That's an important word. So then if we're of the truth, we are from the person of truth. And as from someone from the person of truth, then our actions in love confirm the truth of our relationship in Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Our behavior confirms our relationship. Love is a person. Truth is a person. When you read 1 Corinthians 4 and following, where it gives love is patient, love is kind, love is all of these qualities, who is he talking about? We often read that at weddings, but who is he talking about? He's talking about Jesus. Those are the qualities of Jesus. He's patient, he's kind, he's loving, he's all of these things. What are we expected to be? Of the truth. Of him. Fifth principle, self-conviction. And we'll assure our heart before him in whatever our heart condemns us. You know, there is something within all of us called a conscience. And it can create a guilty heart. How many of you have ever been praying and all of a sudden comes, something comes up in your mind and you go, oh, where'd that come from? I hope I'm not the only one. Where did that thought come from? How did that sneak in here? There's no escaping a guilty heart. But God is faithful and just to cleanse us from what? All unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. And like Cain, we can deny or lie to ourselves, but our heart convicts us. Like a little kid saying, no, I didn't do that. It was funny, a story. Jane did something, and her mom said, what did you do? And she said, I didn't do it. Michael did it. 
So Michael got a paddling. Years later, as a teenager, they're talking. I think it was in the kitchen, washing dishes or doing something in the kitchen. Janie says, well, you never found out about this, but this is what I did. And her mom says, yeah, I just found out about it. Be sure your sin's going to find you out. You see, you know what's in your heart, but the beauty is, Romans 1.20 tells us we can't deny the truth of our sinfulness, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. You can't be excused. You know. You can't hide that. And it may be in the corner of the playground of your mind where you think nobody else goes, but guess what? God's there. The only escape for a guilty heart is in the forgiveness of Christ, the unconditional love and forgiveness of the Savior. Second Timothy, nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows who those who are his, and everyone who names the name of the Lord is, a, abs, is to abstain from wickedness. wickedness excuse me. If you're right in your relationship with Jesus, you keep short accounts with him. Then God, by his grace, confirms that you are without guilt. What a wonderful place to be. You're without guilt. You're forgiven. What a wonderful reason to leave it all on the field for Jesus. Which brings us to the sixth principle, the principle of faithful obedience. Look, there's no way around this. If you're in right relationship with him, you're commanded to obey him in love. You're compelled by it. You're compelled by the love of Christ in you to obey him. You obey him in love. You do it because of love. He doesn't hold your arm up behind your back. He doesn't coerce you. He just simply says, I love you, I've forgiven you. And because of that wonderful thing, that freedom that he gives you, the burden is lifted and you can look at him and say, Lord, I love you. And because I love you, here I am. I'm all yours. I give you everything. I give you back what you gave me. It's yours. I hold nothing in reserve. You know, sad truth is, too many of us as believers hold in reserve things we ought to be giving up to Christ. The final most powerful principle is the principle of unconditional love. Whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. For this is his commandment that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. We obey out of love regardless of personal cost because it pleases him. It pleases him. How many of you ever heard the story of the gift of the Magi? You remember the story? It's a story by O. Henry. This young couple, they're in poverty. He owns a watch. She has beautiful long hair. It's Christmas time. They want to give one another a gift. But they're broke. They have no money. And because they love one another, they give the only thing they have. She goes to a place and she sells her beautiful hair to buy a chain for his watch. And he loves her so much that he takes the watch that was a gift, an heirloom, and he takes it to a jeweler and he sells it to buy her a ribbon for her hair. They gave all that they had out of love for one another. Can we do any less for God? Can we withhold anything from God? He loves us so much. He loves you today. Listen, if you have not given your life to Christ, if you have not asked him into your heart to forgive your sin, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day when you can say to him, Lord, I owe you so much. I can never repay it. You paid a debt you did not owe for me. 
Can we do any less for him? Today you have an opportunity to say, Lord, I thank you for your sacrifice on my behalf. Please forgive my sin. Come into my heart. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. I give my life to you. You may be a believer. You may have been a believer for years. You may have attended church for years and years and years, but you've kept something back. Maybe it's the willingness to get up a little earlier and spend time with Him. Maybe it's taking that mission trip that you've thought about but never accomplished, and you say, how am I going to do it? I don't have the kind of money it takes. You know, if God calls you, He supplies you. He equips you. I challenge you today to leave it all on the field for Him. You know, you'll hear coaches talk about their teams, and there's a big game, well, like the Super Bowl recently. And what they say is, when the game is over, did you leave it all on the field? Did you withhold anything? If they can say that about a football game, can you say that about your life in Christ? He has it all. It's his. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for giving everything for me. Thank you for giving everything for these people. Thank you for giving everything for our neighbors, lifting them up, Lord, bringing them peace. Lord, I pray today that you will speak to the hearts of your children, that they would love one another as you have loved us. We give you thanks and praise for that in Jesus' name. Amen.